Because when I say we looked at our part, the book doesn't say that. The book says setting aside the other person entirely, we resolutely looked for our own mistake. Well, hello, friends of Bill W. and other friends. You have landed on Sober Speak. My name is John M. I am an alcoholic, and we are glad you are all here, especially newcomers. Newcomers, that is, both to recovery as a whole and newcomers to this podcast. Sober Speak is a podcast about recovery centered around the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. My job here on Sober Speak is simple. My job is to provide a platform to the amazing stories of recovery all around us. Consider Sober Speak, if you will, your meeting between meetings. Please remember, we do not speak for AA or any 12 step community. We represent only ourselves. We are here to share our experience, strength, and hope with those who wish to come along for the ride. Take what you want and leave the rest at the curb for the trash man to pick up. From Studio A, deep in the heart of Texas, that was the voice of Mr. Charlie P. that you heard at the beginning of this episode. You are going to hear so much more from him and Uno Momento. First things first, this episode is brought to you by Jim and Jane and David and Gerhard and Trudy and Kate and Marie and a non wild mouse. Do you know what? Jim and Jane and David and Gerhard and Trudy and Kate and Marie and Anonymous did? Well, let me fill you in. They went to our website. Soberspeak.com. They clicked on that little yellow donate tab and they made a, a contribution. So thank you once again, Jim and Jane and David and Gerhard and Trudy and Kate and Marie and Anonymous. This episode is coming right out to you and you're going to so much enjoy this episode with Mr. Charlie P and Un Momento. I, John M., just another bozo on the bus, will indeed be the chairperson for this meeting between meetings, and I am truly honored and privileged to serve all of you listening in, so take a seat, if you will, around this virtual table, and let's get started. Remember, no matter where you are or what your past looks like, you are welcome here It is an open table to all, and we are so glad that you have joined us. So I was reading through our super secret Facebook group this week, and I noticed a post from my friend, Mr. Nelson, and he was talking about a meeting that I was actually in. And Nelson wrote in uh, the secret Facebook group, he said, today at the nooner, David G, and many of you are familiar with David D- G. He was actually chairing the meeting there I was in, or we were all in, I should say. He said, today at the Nooner, David G talked about the importance of restraint of pen and tongue. And today's Daily Reflection speaks of pause, a double header, Nelson says. We pause and ask. And then he puts the quote in there from the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, page 87. It says, as we go through the day, we pause when agitated or doubtful and ask for the right thought or action. Do you need to pause today? Do I need to pause today and ask for the right thought or action? Let me read that again because I think it's very powerful. It says on page 87... As we go through the day, we pause when agitated or doubtful. Are you agitated or doubtful today? And ask for the right thought or action. 
Once again, that's page 87. Thank you so much, Nelson, for putting that in the Super Secret Facebook group. And, uh, you know, as I'm kind of scrolling through the uh, Facebook group here, there are, oh gosh, just tons of birthdays. And I don't want to say one because I'm, I'm afraid I may... I I don't want to leave anybody out, but there's tons of birthdays, you know, anniversaries, lots of celebrations, uh, people with, uh, people with, uh, you know, six months, people with a year, people with multiple years, 30, 40, 50 years, and uh, all kinds of folks in here. And then there was one in here. I was looking at this the other day. This got a lot of reaction. All the controversial stuff gets reaction, you know. Uh, you know, it's like they always say they don't report on the number pl- uh, number of planes that landed safely at the airport. Right? It's just the ones that crash and burn. But nonetheless, James posted it in here, and he said, my girlfriend's ex-sponsor is smoking CBD. She asks me my opinion on it, and I says it still changes the way you feel. What are y'all's thoughts? And he got all kinds of comments, and I'm not going to go through them, right? But it's just, uh, it, you know, I guess it's a place to kind of sit down. We we wouldn't talk about that uh, in an AA meeting, generally speaking, you know, um, and as all of you, or most of you know, uh, AA has no opinion on outside issues. However, uh, the group members have plenty of opinions <laughs> on outside issues, and some of that stuff's in here, and then there's all kinds of conferences and Zoom meetings and all that sort of stuff. And I do get asked a lot of times, hey, where can I find a Zoom meeting? And if you come on in here into the Facebook group, by the way, you're wondering, how do I get in that Facebook group? Well, Well, you go to the Facebook uh, application and you look up Sober Speak Secret Group. You ask for admission and we will get you in there. It's pretty simple. Um, But that's it. Uh, I I just wanted to read that, uh, what Nelson had put in there. And now we're going to go into some, a little bit of uh, uh, an introduction for Mr. Charlie. So Charlie, we have done several episodes with him in the past. This is his fifth episode, I believe, that we have actually uh, done. And this one is called, We Launch Into Action. Uh, And it's regarding the the fifth step. And um, at least that's kind of where we start. And in this particular episode... Charlie talks about how to use the book as a spiritual guide when turning statements into questions. Charlie warns against minimizing someone else's behavior, or excuse me, minimizing someone else's experience. And my favorite quote from our time together is Charlie says, if I'm going to be free, the problem's got to be me. <laughs> I like that. We talk about the fifth step promises on page 75 of the big book and much, much more. And I'm not going to say a lot, but I will tell you this. If you're out there and you can throw up a little extra prayer for Mr. Charlie, uh, it would be appreciated. And at some other point, I'll probably expand on that a little bit more or let Charlie do it. But nonetheless... Stay tuned, or not stay tuned, uh, enjoy the, this episode, and we will have plenty of oh, listener feedback on the end of this episode. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, Charlie P. Okay, everybody, so today we are sitting here uno mas tiempo, one more time. <laughs> We're Mr. Charlie P, and we are kind of taking a slow walk through the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and the steps. So, Charlie, why don't you go ahead, introduce yourself, give your sobriety date if you wish, and then tell people where you are in this great land of ours. Okay. Hi, John. It's good to see you again. I'm, I'm Charlie Kerr. I'm a very grateful alcoholic. I'm in Austin, Texas. My home group is a primary purpose group, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. We meet live on Tuesday nights at 2701 South Lamar at 7.30 p.m. Come see us if you're ever in Austin. A lot of people have. And um, and then uh, we also meet on Zoom on Wednesday nights 
I'm just going to say it. The Zoom information is 630-577-473, p.m. Central Time uh, uh, on Wednesday nights. And we've been getting several hundred people for, for that meeting. So, And we're in a very exciting part of the book. We're starting the doctor's opinion. Uh, so... And if somebody comes into that meeting and wants to kind of like meet you, so to speak, I know I've had a couple of people contact me, right? And they oh. wanted your name and how to contact you and all that kind of stuff. But if somebody's in that meeting, they get how do, what do they do? Raise their hand on a, sure. like a zoom thing. Anything is fine. I mean, uh, you can come, we can speak before the meeting. You can hang out after the meeting. You can, you know, pipe up in the chat during the meeting. I mean, there's a lot of things, but we, we get, we have people literally from all over the world that don't have access to a solution-based big book study, you know, step workers type format. And um, at literally people from New Zealand and South Africa and Australia and people in Europe staying up till one, two o'clock in the morning, you know, to, to get access. Some people in Abu Dhabi getting up at 5 a.m you know, to be able to access the, the, the solution. My, my belief is that real alcoholics are drawn to real solution. And hopefully that's what they'll hear. Oh, my gosh. Before we go any further, you know, you talked about getting – I've had some very good conversations with people. But I made the mistake of going on and, and listening to a few lines on the podcast, and I was like, oh, my God, I have this delusion that my voice is only – a little bit bad. <laughs> <laughs> I listened to a few lines in one of those workshops. Now it was from a while back, but I was like, "Oh my god, that is just awful." So I just want to apologize up front. That this is about as good as it gets. And please listen for content and not tone and clarity. You know. <laughs> it was, yeah. It's funny you say that because I just got back from a meeting myself and uh, somebody came up to me after the meeting and they said, hey, I was just listening to you or your podcast in the car on the way over. It was really a great episode. I said, who are you listening to? They go, oh, I can't remember the name, but it's that guy. He's got a really gravelly voice. <laughs> I said, oh, you're talking about Charlie Fee. And so well, you know. the content is great. They told me if they cut on it anymore, I could lose my voice. And um, I, so I can still sell stuff and I can still do AA talks like this and sponsor guys. So we're just going to see how it goes. Yeah. You know, so kind of just real quick, because we always have new people that are joining in, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, in terms of your your voice that you recently had some throat surgery there, well, right? Well, back earlier in the year, and it didn't go super well. Just some lasers. I've had voice issues since I was 28. I, um, I was grabbed in the. I'm not saying this is what did it because I also drank a lot of cheap whiskey and inhaled a lot of stuff, you know. Uh, but I was also grabbed by the throat by a cop one time. I, I think we had a differing opinion. And, you know, my mouth was open at the time it happened, you can say. So. Um, uh, but uh, it's, it's, since 2012, we've been doing procedures and you know, uh, examinations and, and stuff. And thank God for the throat surgeon I do have. I said, just keep me walking and talking and, you know, we'll be fine. So you had a little bit of a different opinion than that officer you ran across <laughs> yeah. about. Once again. Once again. <laughs> All right. Okay, so last time we left off, and by the way, if you all have not heard Charlie in the past, just in case this is the first time you're hearing him, he's got at least four other episodes. Go back through my episodes, you look for Charlie P, and we're kind of, we started off with a story, and now we're kind of taking a, a slow walk through the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, it's uh, basically like a big book workshop. Is, is Would you call it that, Charlie? Is that I sure say? hope so. So it was step workshop uh, through the big book, and uh, you know, I, uh, um, I, uh, I, I've been, I've heard the term big book thumper. I've heard big book technician. I'm not offended by either of those terms. I, I, I do like to think of myself as a step worker, you know, in 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 talks and in my personal life. If uh, you know, AA. 
loses all its value if it becomes theory. You know, if we're not, if if I'm not, if I'm, if I get to the point where I'm saying, hey, take my advice, I'm not using it. You know, um, and then it, 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 when A becomes theory, it loses its heart. But uh, I, I do a lot of step work in my life. My sobriety date is March twenty second of nineteen eighty five. Uh, we find ourselves today on um, dark period of the year. I, uh, October 28th, my wife, Katie P, crossed over into 37 years of sobriety. So there's a five-month period of the year where my wife has a year more than I do. And it's, <laughs> I, I avoid sobriety countdowns during that period. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's funny. Yeah, she likes to say when I'm struggling, she says, honey, just stick around for about five more months and it'll make a lot more sense to you. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to be recording. Uh, I've got her set to record uh, sometime in December. I can't remember exactly well, when, but I'm looking forward to it. Brace yourself. She's like getting a drink from a fire hose. You know, that's so. what I understand. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to talking to her, though. Well, you know, uh, We've been going through the steps, and, and I really pound those pages 60 to 63. My, my biggest movement that took place uh, at, in my 17th year of sobriety was a new understanding of the third step and the way it's presented in page 60 to 63 and what I call the self piece. That's what you and I have been visiting at depth and, and how we get to that. And then what we're, it changes what we – if I'm not taking the lead too strong here, I just, you know, um, it changes what we take into inventory. You know, my first third step was just a bunch of churchy talk. And my first inventory was just kind of a confession of people I was mad at, stuff I felt bad about. That's right. Not terrible, but not what I see now when I look at the book. And, and we went over that self piece with some, real depth and go back and listen to some of that because that's what we carry in to the fourth step where now we're looking for manifestations of self and the way they show up and we got through that you know at the end of last week where it says we hope you're now convinced that god can remove whatever self will has blocked you off from it so that's where we find ourselves we made a decision an inventory of our grocery handicaps we made a good beginning, and we've swallowed and digested some big chunks of truth about ourselves. So we said last time that we were going to um, start off at into action, right? Into action. And for those of you, so if you're driving, obviously you don't want to be doing this, but for those of you reading along at home, uh, I would highly suggest you get out a big book there, make some markup, take some notes, whatever you need to do. In fact, Charlie, I, I want to let you know that uh, uh, I, I can't remember if I've said this in one of the other uh, episodes that we've recorded or not, but at one point you were talking about a a question or a comment that had occurred in the big book in the first part of where we were talking about. Mm-hmm. Uh, it could have been anything. It could have been, you know, what about a real alcohol or actually, no, 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 let me take it back. It, it was some sort of self-reflection type of question. Mm-hmm. And you pause and you said, when you, when you talked about that, you said, and right out here, in next to this line in my big book, I have the question written out. Am I? Right. Question mark. We believe and, strongly. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, John. Well, and ever since you said that, it, it's kind of, you know, and, and I've been through other studies before where I think they call it inductive study or something like that. I've done the same thing with the Bible for me personally in the past. Mm-hmm. And, but whenever you did that, it made me think about these little lines that I hear in the big book, not only in meetings, but when I read it on my own and and, and, and it's important to pause and reflect and ask myself what that actually means to me. And Absolutely. you were going to say? Well, we b- believe strongly and I come from this Don Prince, Mark Houston lineage and, and Mark believes strongly in turning statements into questions in the book. I mean, you come to a statement like that, where it says the first requirement is that I, you know, are being convinced. It was on 64 at the beginning of the inventory process where we came across that question where it said, 
being convinced that self manifested in various ways is what had defeated us, well, that's not always a fair assumption to make about everybody walking through the doors of AA or in their step work process. You know? So I have to ask myself, am I convinced that self showing up in various ways or do I think I just had a drinking problem? You know? Yeah, the 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 meeting that I just got 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 back from what I was telling you about the 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 topic was that line in the book where it says you know God either is or he isn't either he's everything or he's nothing at all right mm-hmm. and that's one of those uh, I mean that's a showstopper especially for me as when I you know I was first in Alcoholics Anonymous I'm like you know that's pretty strong language but I. I think the important part is to stop there, pause, and ask myself, you know, do I believe that God is everything? You know, do I believe that he's everything? Uh, And and just kind of, you know, filter that through my own perception of the God of my understanding and, you know, kind of take it from there. The day that line became real to me, um, I was well into sobriety. And I was in the face of a huge collapse my professional world and I was in trouble personally and I was in my late teens in sobriety and Katie said well God either is or in and for some reason that day that line sunk to a new level or ascended to a new level we, we could say and, and for years I couldn't even describe the experience without getting emotional because you know when when that when I see the, the power of God moving in my life or in my heart, it's like, wow, that, that was, you know, that was just chatter for so long. And all of a sudden it's like, man, because if, if we have been taking the third step to the extent that it requires us to, I realize that my, on my own power is not going to get the job done, you know, and, and, and in the absence of God, or some power, whatever you want to call it. You know, one of the things I, I like to say before I forget to say it um, is that uh, um, there's a lot of spiritual paths that people in AA follow, and and whether it's Eastern, Western, uh, um, Native American, you know, wherever you find, there's a lot of paths. You know, but what we're trying to do is try to do those things along with AA not instead of. And so what we're trying to do in this step process is set a basis of spiritual approach. When it says it's a design for living that really works, it really is, uh, you know, when practiced according to the clear-cut directions laid out in the book. One of the biggest problems in the book is on page 29, where it says further on, clear-cut directions are given showing how we recover. Why? You know, thank you for that, because... And the kind of trouble I was in, I need clear-cut directions. And, uh, you know, we've got so much ground to cover, but it, it's kind of funny. Uh, trying to do it into action today it reminds me, I, I went to a conference one time in, in Florida. We were speaking, and it was called Chapters in Recovery. And great group of people, but rather than give everybody a step, like they do at the Woodstock type of conferences, they gave everybody a chapter, you know? And so Katie had, uh, I think Katie had How It Works, and I had Into Action. And, you know, step one is pretty much in the doctor's opinion in the first 44 pages of the book. And then step two, we agnostics and, you know, and, and that sort of thing. And then step three takes place on page 60. Then we do step four in step, and, and the rest of how it works. But when I got up there to talk at that conference in, in, in uh, Florida, and I said, so I've got the chapter in it, which means I have uh, 55 minutes to sum up steps five, six, seven, the entire amends process in eight and nine, and then the spot check inventory in step 10, evening review, morning prayer, prayer and meditation, you know, in, in 11, that's it, you know. I I hope we don't run out of anything to talk about. And uh, and I want to tell you real quick uh, before you're going on, before I forget to say this, uh, you know, my wife, the lovely Mrs. M, what she does is after these, uh, 
um, a- after I record these episodes and before I'm about to publish one, um, I, I, we have a, uh, sh- she does the, the transcripts. And so this last couple of weeks, she's been looking at your transcript and she's been, t- and so she not only looks at the transcript, but she goes through and makes sure that, you know, all the words are right. So she listens to you at the same time and she has become a Charlie P fan and she's <laughs> never met you. And when I was coming up here today to record you, she goes, oh, who are you recording? And I go, I'm with Charlie P. She goes, oh, well, tell Charlie P. I said, hello. I go, oh, that's fine. You want to come up here and meet him? She goes, well, not right now, but I'll, maybe I'll come up afterwards or whatever the case may be. I'd love so, to see her, and thank you know, and thank God for people with low standards. You know, I, you know. <laughs> <laughs> let me take a little break here. We'll go out. We'll be we will be continuing our conversation with Charlie P in just a moment. Just a reminder: you are listening to Sober Speak. And you can find us on the World Wide Web at www.soberspeak.com. There you can also find the donate button on our website. You can use if and only if the spirit moves you to do such. Please keep in mind this is a podcast funded by you, the listener, and we are self-supporting through our own contributions. All right. Now back to Mr. Charlie P. All right. So into action. Like you said, there's... Mm. It's chock full of nuts. We're not going to run out of things to talk about. So where do you want to start with that? Well, let's start right at the top. It says, having made our personal inventory, what And by the way, for that? those of you reading along at home, just in case you don't know where this is, this is chapter six. It's called Into Action, and it is on page 72. I had so, to point I'm out, sorry. I had to point out to a sponsor one time that we don't have a chapter called Into Thinking. That's right. So, but it, here it says, because here's a question, Ashton, what have we been trying to do here? And it says, having made our personal inventory, what shall we do about it? We have been trying to, one, get a new attitude, two, a new relationship with our creator, and three, to discover the obstacles in our path. Wow, we could spend an hour on each one of those three points right there. But that is so uh, so so let's go through how you would possibly do that when you're actually studying the book by turning a statement into a question. So go ahead. Well, see, we've done so much work up to now, and what we're rolling into here is the fifth step in recovery. Now, I'm not going to be able to spend a tremendous amount of time on it. One of the things I like, you know, it says we've admitted certain defects. When? In our in our inventory, and, and mainly in the fourth column of our inventory, we've seen, if the way I do it, I'm showing how I'm trying, I say I'm in the entirely different angle business. I'm trying to point out to people a different perspective, that sort of thing. And because the, one of the things that when we, if the problem is self, one of the things that happens in the inventory process is in the, in the fourth column, I see, oh my God, my take is so self-centered, you know, and, and but I have to have, and, and my buddy, Mike L., called me a minute ago while we were trying to talk. And I, I go to him for this stuff because I can hand out these different perspectives all day long, but I'm blind to it in myself. And I have to, I'll go to him, I'll go to some Danny B, a different friends of mine, and, and they'll hand it right back to me where you go, well, let's try to look at this from a different perspective. And, and you know, so um, it says, you know, these things are about to be, We've ascertained in a rough way what the trouble is. Really? Have we? Well, it's supposed to be self. And I remember over at the beginning of the third step, it was a fair question about what do you mean by that and what do you want me to do? And then we roll through what it means and what we're doing. And we come out of here with our inventory. It's funny because it says um, this requires extra, which when completed will mean we've admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our defects. This brings us to the fifth step in the program of recovery. Well, we got to move here, but I mean, a whole lot of this next two pages talks about why we're going to do the inventory and who we're going to do it with and what kind of qualities we're going to look for. Him. And, and I love where it says, um, this is difficult perhaps, especially talking to somebody else about our defects. We think we've done well enough admit them to ourselves. There is doubt about that. And this is a big line that I carry through my whole sobriety. It says, in actual practice, 
we usually find a solitary self-appraisal insufficient. Mm. I called my sponsor up one time and I said, you know, after this happened to me, but I, I think I'm doing pretty good. And he goes, well, I'd be careful about grading my own papers. You know, I, <laughs> <laughs> you know so uh, we got to go further. And, and the, why? Well, the best reason first, if we skip this final step, we may not overcome drinking. So I think that's worth repeating again. Uh, I, and I have a highlighted in my book as well. Mm -hmm. It says the best reason for why do we have to do this? Well, the best reason first, if we skip this vital step, we may not overcome drinking. Right. If you want to roll the dice on that one. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so you know trying to avoid this here's another one trying to avoid this uh, um, humbling experience they've tried to turn to easier methods but, and, and so it talks about what happens and find out that now here's the thing when we get on I love this paragraph on page 73 because just like the bedevilments on page 52 can apply to me in my sobriety I can also be a big phony in recovery. And it's and when he talks about this, we talk about the man on page 73 a lot, where he says he, he, he wants to enjoy a certain reputation, but knows in his heart he doesn't uh, deserve it. And, but I don't know that we don't. I mean, I try not to hold myself up too high so you won't be too disappointed if you have to take a close look at me sometimes. You know, <laughs> a lot of us don't hold up that well. And, 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 but, you know, uh, one of my favorite quotes is that God uses broken people to do his work because that's all he has to work with. <laughs> <laughs> but one time I, I had a sponsor getting a chip. A 10 year chip, and I was giving it to him. And I was up at this big treatment center where we had an alumni meeting, and big night. And, and the next day, I'm in the Sprint store, and I have to really get prayed up before I go in the Sprint store. And this was a bad day. And I, the guy, I'm yelling at the guy behind the counter, and he goes back into the back of the room. And I turn, and this guy's looking at me kind of funny. And I, I go, Oh man, they're getting me kind of worked up. And he looks at me and grins for a minute, and he goes, did you see me get my 90 day chip last night? <laughs> and I'm like, oh no. You know, so I was like, listen, buddy, what you just saw was not the principles of our program. <laughs> if you stick around, you'll see what an active 10th step looks like. You know? but, but, you know, skipping on down, uh, it's, it, it talks about um, how. And it says, we must be entirely honest with somebody. I'm going to get through this really fast. Read these pages, though. Study them like it's a test, you know, because when we talk about how we're dishonest with counselors and, and, and psychiatrists, and then, then when you turn to 74, it says, rightly and naturally, we think well before we choose the person or persons with whom to take this intimate, confidential step. Now, here's a very interesting line that I never gave much it says, those of us belonging to a religious denomination, which requires confession, must, and of course will want to, go to the properly appointed authority whose duty it is to receive it. That line was added in in the original manuscript under review and saved the lives of millions of Catholic alcoholics mm. because the Catholic Church was about to drop the hammer on the Oxford movement and they were not at all down with lay people hearing uh, confession as they mm. looked at it. And so look at just how you insert one little line here and, and it says, uh, those of us belonging to a religious denomination which requires confession must, and of course will want to, go to the properly appointed authority whose duty it is to receive it. Boom. Now everything's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, and we can keep going. I don't, I don't, but it says, and then we don't have any religious connections. See, now it's telling us who we want to do it with. You know, sometimes we run into people who don't understand. Uh, we don't want to wait. But we want to be sure we find the right person. And here's an interesting line. Well, this is not the stuff I thought we were going to talk about today. But, you know, when I'm doing inventory, sometimes I got to look at, Who's going to be helped, you know, uh, and, and I need to make sure that I don't, you know, if 
somebody has a resentment at my wife, I'm probably not the guy to share it with, you know, or, you know, it, it, because it says, we have no right to save our skin at another person's expense. Have you ever had anybody come up and say, I owe you amends? Because I, I used to think you were just a real piece of junk and talk <laughs> trash about you, and, and now I'm sorry, and I don't feel that way anymore. And you go, oh, well, thanks a lot. I'm, I'm glad you feel better. <laughs> now, I got to go write inventory. You know? <laughs> and it says, such parts of our story we tell to someone who will understand yet be unaffected. There's a lot of times where if I'm going to share a certain piece, I mean, I need to make sure. Sometimes I even have to tell you, you probably, you probably might want to go talk to somebody else about that piece because I'm not sure I can be objective about that little piece of inventory right there. Mm -hmm. does, does that make sense? Yeah, and, for sure. And look at the rule. The rule is we must be hard on ourselves but always considerate of others. Mm -hmm. You know, and th this addresses to me, I got this written in my book. This addresses whether when to do so would injure them or others. Others does not include me. You know, there, there's people that, that act like, well, it would injure me to, to say this. And it, no, no that, that doesn't fit under the rule. The rule is we're to be hard on ourselves, but uh, considerate of others. That's that right. So, oh, yeah, yeah, that does make sense. And that's why... You know, you hear about it all the time, you know, people that come into the rooms and they look up at the wall, they see the amends and they start going making amends real quickly to old girlfriends or whatever the case may be, or old boyfriends. And uh, the motives are not right. And uh, that's why it's best to sometimes slow people down and just say, hey, are you being considerate of others and hard on yourself here. Yeah. And, and you know, some, do, do you want your wife to hear you making amends to ex-girlfriends, which is fine. We want to clean stuff up. But what if your family members are sitting there going, uh, when's he going to get around to us? Right. You, know, you know, I mean, um, and, and now here, here's the three things we look for that somebody's going to hear the inventory. It's important that he, this is the bottom of 74. It's important that he, one, be able to keep a confidence. Two, that he fully understand and approve what we're driving at. And three, that he won't try not to change our plan. I don't want to go to somebody that says, oh, you don't need to do all this. It's water under the bridge. You know, you know, just be a good guy. So what do you think? You know what? I'm just now noticing that for the first time. I've heard the other part, but he will not try to change our plan. Uh -huh. What do you think it means by that? Well, if you're involved in a process that requires um, awareness, talking to somebody else about it, going out and making amends for it. Uh, and somebody says, oh, you know, you, you're a good guy when you're not drinking. Just, you know, uh, that all that yeah. stuff is water under the bridge. You got enough said, you, you know, we'll call it even. And you're like, no, it's really important that I get unblocked here. You're right. Like, in other words, you don't want to have your mom... Uh, giving you advice on following through with this plan because yeah. mom will say, don't worry about it, Johnny. You're yeah. just fine. Right. Well, that, and which leads us right into the next paragraph. It says, uh, we've written an inventory. We're prepared for a long talk. And here's a question that Mark hit me with one time where it says, we explain to our partner what we're about to do and why we have to do it. He goes, well, what are we about to do? And why do we have to do it? And I was like, uh, what's your answer? <laughs> and, and he said, we're trying to, remember at the end of the fourth sentence, it says, we want to face and be rid of the things that are blocking us from this power. The thing we've admitted in the third step is our only shot. And, you know, in the third step, it says, stay close to him and perform his work well. Well, I can't stay close to him till I get close to him, and I can't get close to him when I'm blocked. So what we're going to try to do in this process is at least remove enough of what's blocking me that I can have some flow of power, so, you know, between me and this power that I've admitted is the only shot I've got. Now, here, here comes... 
It's funny, most of the instructions for the fifth step are contained in the fourth step, where it's telling us what we're going to look for and, and, and that sort of thing. But it, it's funny because it says, now there is one little piece here where it says, we, you know, because really the instructions for the fifth step are really short. It's just this little paragraph here. It says, we pocket our pride and go to it, illuminating every twisted character, every dark cranny of the path. Well, um, that's pretty short, you know, but one time I was talking to a guy that I really admire, Scott L. from, uh, used to be from Nashville. He's, he may be back in Tennessee now, but he was in Florida for a while. But I, I called him up one time and I said, you know, I'm pretty clear on the process, the way it's laid out in the book. Uh, I've seen where we look at our resentments and our fears and, and our, uh, manifestation of self when the sexual instinct is around. But I said, where's the deepest, darkest secrets? You know, where's the things that, you know how they say, tell me the worst thing you ever did? Or sometimes they'll say, well, you know, wow, what's the thing you've already decided you're not going to tell me? You know, and that sort of thing. And he said, well, it's in the fifth step. And I said, keep going. And he goes, well, see what it says, illuminating, which means shining light upon every twist of character, every dark cranny of the past. So to me, this is where we address the take it to the grave stuff. And sometimes uh, we'll address it on the front end, like we were talking about going, you know, what's the thing you've already decided you're not going to tell me? Sometimes I'll do it in the middle, and sometimes I'll do it at the very end. You know, where I, 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 one of my favorite boys, uh, we did a heck of an inventory one time, and uh, now, at the, in, the, in the resentment inventory, we talked about it a lot in the earlier recordings about the fourth column and where have we been selfish and dishonest and self-seeking and frightened. And my favorite thing to hear when a guy's going over a resentment like that is when they see it from another perspective, when they go, oh, my God, I never thought about that for a minute. And that's where the magic happens, where... Over and over again, I can't tell you how many times me and people I worked with have come into this process with a resentment, seen it from an entirely different angle, looked at our own mistakes, and you go, and you come out the other end with an amends to go back. You know, and, and that's where the freedom is in this vigorous course of action. So, so let me stop you there real quick because okay. you know. I just want to talk about this line because you know uh, we say it. Uh, but I know that when I was first going through this process, and I'm thinking about this from a newcomer coming into the program now, and as you know, a lot of people get up to this point, and then they'll kind of back off. But the, the line is, we pocket our pride, we go to it, the fifth step, illuminating every twist of character, every dark cranny of the past. Now, those are words on a, on a page here, but I know that a lot of people um, get a little bit worried at this point, And they think to themselves, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I want to do this. I know what's going on in my head here. I know all these thoughts. I know what I've done in the past. I'm not sure if I want to share this with anybody. Mm -hmm. Ta take me through some of your experience when you've had guys that get to that point. <laughs> That's why I think it's so important that it's that we acknowledge the presence of God in this process. Every time I hear inventory, I, and, and I, I pray our I pray our way into the space, and I pray our way out of it at the end of it. I'm not saying everybody's going to do that, but it says, <clears throat> but um, on my own power, I might not be able to do it, you know. But if I'm surrendered, and and, and so sometimes, and that's what happened with with my boy. Uh, at the end of it, he, he finished his piece of paper they brought brought in, and uh, and I said, "Is that it?" We'd gone over his, his resentments and his fears and sexual stuff, that sort of thing. And I said, uh, is that it? He goes, yep, yep, that's it. I go, that's everything. So he goes, yeah, that's right. I go, nothing left. You want to talk to me? He goes, nope, nope. And, you know, in the 10th step, it says, well, it, it promises us intuition by this point. And sometimes things come to me. And I just sensed that that wasn't it, you know. And I said, well, it's funny because, you know, I know in my image, some of the stuff I felt the worst about was stuff that centered around 
this, you know, or th- was edited around that. And, and that's the stuff I felt most shame about. And, but I wasn't going to talk about it. When it says we hung on to the worst items in stock, you know, it's like the stuff that's, if we're trying to get unblocked, my ego will tell me, hang on to the worst stuff. And that's the stuff that blocked me the most, you know? Um, so I said that, and he goes, there's a heavy pause, and he goes, there's something else. I said, okay, you know, what is it? And he talked about something, you know, that was, and, and the other thing you got to do, be careful about when you're hearing inventory is not to minimize these people's experience because what might not be a blip on my radar's, radar screen can be a deep source of shame and blockage for somebody else. So even though it seems consoling, I don't think it's freeing to say, oh, that's nothing. I used to do that, you know, or, uh, you know, because I got to let him have his experience with what's blocking him. And so he said, there's something else. I said, okay. And he talked about it. And then he, he said, there's a man. He goes, okay, there's something else. And, and, and he talked about that for a while. And we, got, you know, we went a little deeper. And so he left and gave him the instructions for what comes after this. And, Ten minutes later, my phone rings and he goes, there's one more thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I don't want to leave this undone. But, you know, there's a lot of instructions about how to hear. There was a time, uh, I'm going to have to just go in, so we may not get out of the fifth step today, but there was a time when I thought my job as a sponsor here in your fifth step was to sit there and listen to you read your fourth step. And I've been on both sides of that, uh, where the guy just sat there and listened to me read the columns on my was that an inventory and that sort of thing. And now I take a really active role in uh, here in inventory. And, and because when it says we're on a fact-finding and a fact-facing mission, I have come to believe that my job, his job is the fact-facing, and my job is the fact-finding. Because mm-hmm. I he may not be able to see it from an entirely different perspective. So a lot of times my job is to get, I'm like a news reporter going, okay, there's resentment against your dad. You know, how was the situation? How many kids in your family? What was going, you know, and you start shaping the story and you will hear yourself intuitively saying stuff that maybe you've never said to anybody else in another inventory. But when I start trying to show it to him from a different angle, in my mind when he's saying it, I've got to have somebody that's telling, taking me to where did I set the ball rolling? Where did I make decisions based on self that later placed me in a position to be harmed? Like it talks about on page 61, you know, and what's an entirely different angle. And sometimes when they're, when they're reading it and I'm thinking of an entirely different angle, the first one I think about is what about theirs? What about the person in column one? You know, how would they tell this story? You know, would they go, oh, I just woke up one day and thought, what can I do to jack with Charlie today? (laughs) (laughs) And and, and sometimes when you get them to see it from, or sometimes I go, well, let me ask you this, because the other thing we got to watch out for is self-righteousness. But, you know, and sometimes I'll go, this this resentment you have, uh, here's what, who you're mad at. Here's what they did. Here's how it affected you. Now, and you've done the sick man exercise. Now, is it possible that there's anybody out in the world that would have this exact same four column inventory, except your name would be in column one? And I've seen guys go, oh my God. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, um, a lot. You know, it's just I happen to find myself on the wrong, right side of it on this one. So, you know, I'm yeah, it, I've been in a, a lot of very uncomfortable situations where conversations, I should say, where people haven't looked at it from that entirely different angle. And then you ask the question and I use that one a lot as well. Like, OK, so I understand what you're saying what would they say about this particular situation? Cool. And then you get them to describe that. And it always, you know, somebody else has always got a little bit of a different angle on it. Right. And they're, well, we, we like to say, if I'm going to be free, the problem's got to be me. And, and, and so I, I went to a meeting this morning where I had to keep my mouth shut 
because the, the topic for the meeting was my part. And if there's a phrase I'd like taken out of AA, it would be the phrase my part, because that still leaves me in a shame, in a victim mentality. We're going to do a little work around so We're going to wind up back at this victim mentality. Because when I say we looked at our part, the book doesn't say that. The book says setting aside the other person entirely, we resolutely looked for our own mistakes. Because if we're looking at my part and their part, one is it, it assumes that they have a part, and it also assumes that I'm qualified to define the parts. You know, <laughs> and that my my part's going to be little bitty, well, right? And, you know, so uh, I do a lot of that. And and so if we're looking for manifestations of self in the resentment inventory, we see them in the fourth column, and then the fear inventory, we look at those as uh, failure of of self of uh, isn't it because um, self reliance. Failed us. So I'm looking in the fair inventory and how it was self reliance and where, you know, that sort of thing. And then, you know, what's a different way, the new basis of trusting and relying upon our creator. And then in, in the sixth inventory, it gives us those nine questions to look at. And, and when, it, when it says, what should we have done instead, not just, well, I shouldn't have slept with her. You know, sometimes it's, you know, we're going to take a little a deeper dive than that. And, and, uh, I would rather do an in-depth approach to your five hot burner resentments than go all the way back to Timmy in the second grade. You know, it's like, you know, we're going to be thorough. But there are times where I go, are you seeing the pattern here? And they're like, yes. And I'm like, are there any of these resentments that are significantly different from these? Like, well, this one is. Okay, let's do that one. You know, and, and that sort of thing. But we, we keep it moving. And the fifth step promises, right? Because after we, it says, right after that line of every dark crayon the present, it comes the fifth step promises. It says, once we have taken this step with holding nothing, we are delighted. We can look the world in the eye. Listen to this. How about these promises? We can look the world in the eye. We can be alone at perfect peace and ease. Our fears fall from us. It doesn't even say that we work on them and diminish them, they start to fall from us when we become God reliant. Uh, our, we begin, here's a huge one, we begin to feel the nearness of our Creator. But we, we may have had certain spiritual beliefs, now we begin to have a spiritual experience. The feeling that the drink problem has disappeared will often come strongly. We feel we're on the broad highway, walking hand in hand with the universe. So many people stop right here. You know, in fact, one time in my first period of sobriety, I walked around. If you just said, what step are you on? I would have said, I would have said I'm on step six, uh, step six. And what that generally means is the last thing I did any work on was step five. Because you really don't spend a lot of time on six. We'll talk about it in the next book. There's a huge piece of work here at the bottom of page 75 that I used to call the hour after the fifth step. It's not. It's the hour at the end of the fifth step. And mm. I, t I tell guys, I go, do not schedule dinner with your family after, for after we do this inventory, because you're not finished until you do this last paragraph. And Mark Houston turned this into an enormous piece of work for me, because it says, returning home, we find a place where we can be quiet for an hour. I tell guys, that's a 60-minute hour we're, we're talking about, and <laughs> carefully reviewing what we have done. We thank God. Here's a prayer. We thank God from the bottom of our heart that we know him better. Clear-cut directions, taking this book down from our shelf, we turn to the page. Was, I'm, now, I'm not exactly sure. Why my book's on the shelf if I've just done inventory the fifth step? But I tell my guys, go home, put your book up on the shelf, take it down. It's, I did it's, that. It's yeah. a ridiculous exercise, and I require it. You know, <laughs> but but it says. But here's the thing: this used to just goof around during this review period. But man, let me take. I want to finish with this last thing. Carefully reading the first five proposals, and off to the side of that, I've written, consider all the implications. 
So when we when we carefully consider the, you know, I have to go back and ask myself: Do I believe I'm bodily and mentally different from my fellows? Am I? Do I have a physical allergy coupled with a mental obsession? Do I understand what it means to be an alcoholic and that I'm also victim of the mental blank spot if I'm not careful? And do I believe that on my own power that I can't manage this uh, on my own power? I have to have the help of a power greater than myself. And, you know, is that the energy I'm carrying into this work? And have I come to believe that there could be some kind of a power that could take me beyond this? And if so, have I, now when we go into on page 60, um, do I understand that I'm the actor trying to run the whole show? And, and do I have this delusion that people would just do as I wish, the show would be great? And, and am I this sometimes kind, sometimes overbearing, the thing it talks about on, on the top of 61, the toolkit of self-will, I call it. And is that me? You know, do, what usually happens? The show doesn't come off very well. Do, I, you know, do I, uh, what usually happens, I uh, become angry, indignant, self Is that my pattern? Is this me we're talking about? Is this my belief based on what I've come to know in this process now? And if I'm convinced that now have I taken that energy and made the deal in the third step that I'm no longer in management and that God's going to be running this show and that's just fine with me. Now I'm convinced that all I have to do is stay close to him and perform his work well. And is that the energy I've carried into this inventory process? That I'm trying to see what's blocking me from this power and how did it go during the inventory process? Did I lay it all out there? Did I get any freedom? Carefully reading the first five proposals We've asked if we have omitted anything. All of a sudden, this hour becomes a serious piece of business. Mm -hmm. And where I'm like, is this head talk or has this landed in my the center of my being? And you know, is our we, we're building an arch to which we shall walk a free man at last. Is our work solid so far? Are the stones properly in place? Have I skimmed? This is this masonry reference that brings together all the masonry references leading up to now where it's talked about the cornerstone, the foundation, the cement, the, the, the keystone, you know, all of them come together in this arch through which we're going to walk a free man at last. And so that's where the guy finds himself at the end of the fifth step. And that's where I think we should, we'll probably have to take up on the next one. Yeah, and just so everybody knows, just in case, uh, I, I can't remember if Charlie said it or I did, but all of that that he's talking about is on page 75 uh, in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. So that's where you can, that's where, if you want to rewind the tape and go back through those questions again, that would be a great way to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, we're but, and we're referencing stuff that we've covered in depth in the earlier podcast, too. That's right. That's right. Okay, Mr. Charlie, this has been another good one. I am going to read from page 164 of the big book here to close this out. It says, abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to him and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the spirit. And you will surely meet some of us like me and Charlie P as you trudge the road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then. Once again, Mr. Charlie, thank you so much for joining me today. I sure appreciate it. Such a pleasure. I have so much fun. With you. Okay. Well, let's get to some time to get back together again. You take care. Bye-bye. <laughs> As always, Mr. Charlie P., so much enjoyed having you on the podcast. And uh, if you are listening out there, a little extra special prayer to you. Um, and uh, you are in my thoughts and prayers, my friend. Now, on to a little bit of listener feedback. Barry writes in. <laughs> <laughs> Barry says, hey, John, legend of the global pod waves. <laughs> well, I don't consider myself a legend of the global pod waves, but I'm glad you do, Barry. He says, greetings from across the pond. Barry is from London, London calling. And he says, I hope this 
email uh, finds you and the family well. Just a courtesy note to say thank you for your continued zeal across the Sober Speak airwaves. 2022 has gotten off to a great start. Some great pause every Friday evening and the perfect start to my weekends. The fellowship has cast a spell on me and tonight... I'm truly grateful. That's a good spell, I think. And then he says, Barry, two years and five months sober. Oh, Barry, I remember you when we first started this podcast trying to uh, uh, get some traction. And uh, two years and five months, that is absolutely fantastic. And he says, just another bozo on the bus I am trying to make a contribution i've never seen the word contribution spelled out before but i guess that's what it looks like <laughs> and then he says tally ho in diddly d in sober speak we trust <laughs> And then he says, in David G, we trust. And a big shout out to Gary K and respect to Reno John and the Arlington crew. He's talking about Reno John and where he lives. He's from Arlington. And he says, a big up to Steve L and the Redondo Beat Massive. <laughs> He's bringing up all of our various speakers he, we have on here. And then he says, peace. To Mrs. M. Aw, he's talking about my lovely bride. He says, word up to y'all in Frisco. <laughs> uh, MC Richie B. He's talking, <laughs> he's talking about Rich B. In Ocean City, Maryland. And the Texas crew. Anyway, he signs off here. Tally ho in diddly D for now, my friend. From across the pond. And then he's got about four or five really happy emojis. Uh, thank you, Barry, for writing in. I appreciate you. Um, now, oh, here's a post on, oh gosh, from that to this. Uh, you know, I read them all, folks. Uh, yeah, maybe I'll stop someday, but it's very interesting to me. So on Apple Podcasts, who is this? L-I-L-L-E-A-5-3-A post. Uh, I, I, I'm assuming that's a lily, but who knows? There's, that, that could be a man, woman in between. You never know. But anyway, uh, this person says, just cut to the speaker. They're reviewing me is what they're doing. Nauseating. He, they're talking about John M, is self-absorbed. Let us listen to the speaker. Well, you know, I've never been called nauseating before that I know, but I, I guess I could check that off my bucket list. I, I don't know. Uh, you know, you can't please all the people all the time. But L-I-L-L-E-A-5-3-A, I do hope that you find a podcast that is more your suiting. Also on Apple Podcasts, someone posts here, and this is from Peace Lily. It says, good content, solid content. Well, thank you, uh, Peace Lily. You must not be listening to the same podcast uh, L-I-L-L-E-A-5-3-A is. But anyway, I appreciate you, Lily, very much. Um, I'm assuming your name... Wait, well, you know what? I just noticed something here. So the first one is... L-I-E-L-L-E, -L -L -E. that would be a lily. And then this one is Peace Lily. Do you think this is a person that has a split personality <laughs> that forgot that they listened to the podcast the first time and then they came back on and listened and left a good review? You never can tell. But I digress. And anyway, Jones writes in our friend Jones. He says, uh, thank you for the meeting between meetings. My sobriety date is August 28, 2017. I have really enjoyed 99% of the episodes. And you know what? I, there's a couple of episodes that actually there's just one in particular that I put out there. I'm not going to say which one it is. 
because you go back and listen to it. But I thought I really should not have put this out there. Uh, and it was back in the beginning. It would have been in the first year. But I thought this was a mistake. But I wonder if we're thinking of the same one when you say 99%. Anyway, he says, I have really enjoyed 99% of the episodes and have gained so many tools to live a better life. I have listened to the episodes from number one all the way through to number 186, Julia. She is a hoot, and I love her enthusiasm. That's a lot of listening there, Mr. Jones. He says, I generally like all the speakers and actually have met some of the AA members that Reno John mentioned when he first started his sobriety in Reno, Nevada. I cannot say who my favorite speaker is because I pretty much love them all. A couple of episodes really changed my perception, such as Brenda J around episode 90 when she said, there is room enough in God's world for everyone. That hit me between the eyes because I can be somewhat judgmental, haha. So when my mind starts to drift into a bad place, that is not within God's love. I think of that phrase and it reels me back into God's love and grace. I can't remember the speaker's name, but she says something to the effect of, I have given up the right to a better past. Oh, you know what? I think I know what that is. That was David G quoting uh, somebody that he was listening to, it was a she, and she was a lawyer, speaking at her birthday celebration, if I remember that right. Anyway, he says, I love this because it helps me stay in the moment when my mind drifts off. Unfortunately, John, my sponsor of 20 years passed away last week, and I am sad. Oh, man, I'm sorry to hear that. He was a good AA man and helped many he had 37 years, and he will be dearly missed. He taught me how to be a good sponsor, and anytime I am blessed to go through the book with a newcomer. I remember how we went through the steps. My sponsor taught me to start from the very beginning of the book, the preface, and so my plan tonight was to research the timeline so I can remember the dates, and lo and behold, I checked my mailbox, and good old John M. left me all I needed for the early AA history. So what he's talking about there is... Um, uh, I sent out a, uh, we have an email list. And if you're not on the email list, you can just go to the website and there's a little form you can fill out there. Or you can email me at john, J-O-H-N, at soberspeak.com and we'll get you on there. But anyway, we sent out a, uh, a post of uh, the early AA history and how it was founded, where it was formed and all that sort of stuff. So if you want to get on that, just reach out to me or go to the website. But anyway, he says, uh, it just so happens that I am starting to work with a newcomer this week and will use that information you sent over. It saved me some time. Thank you. Oh, well, I'm glad, Jones. Anyway, he says, enough out of me. Thank you very much for all the hard, <clears throat> excuse me, hard work and carrying the message via this podcast. May God bless you and your family. Always Jones. Well, Jones, thank you so much. And right back at you. May God bless you and your family always as well. Finally, Tony writes in. And Tony says, hi, John. I hope you're well. Just a heads up to say Hello, I had a few rounds with, I had a real few rounds with, oh, I didn't know what I was going to do there. They said rounds with, I thought, oh, is it rounds of drinks or what? Anyway, with COVID at the end of 2021, it left me fatigued and lacking all forms of motivation. My fellowship buddies kept me going with checkups check-ins now and again, and my faith in the fellowship was always there. At last, I have caught up with the Sober Speak episodes. Reno John, again, gets the nuggets of gold in between the alcoholism sarcasm. 
<laughs> Alcoholic sarcasm. So let me read that again. He said, Reno John again gets the nuggets of gold in between the alcoholic sarcasm. <laughs> That's very true. That's a good way to put it. And uh, if you haven't heard Reno John's uh, uh, episodes, you should go back and listen to all of them. Uh, he's absolutely fantastic. Anyway, uh, Tony goes on. He says, I stopped drinking and began feeling. The pieces fell together. That's why I was depressed in early sobriety. And that's why I am overly aggressive. That's why. That is why, in big capital letters. Hallelujah. I am not nuts. Well, maybe only slightly. But that there, you just can't put money on that. Such a shame. It took me six years and three months to understand that. Well, we all learn a little slow, or at least I learn a little slow, Tony. I completely get it. And he says, next time around, I'll ask God for a coconut for a head. (laughs) A coconut head for Tony. Maybe things would get in there a little more easily. Take care. Tony D. All right, Tony D. I, I I don't know if I've said this before, but when I I when I do when I read that Tony D, we actually have a Tony D in our Frisco group that I attend as well. But when I when I hear and see Tony D, it always takes me back to thinking of uh, Tony Dorsett. And for those of you who are not Dallas Cowboy fan or football fans, it's not going to mean anything to you. But uh, there's a running back out there, and I love him, and his name is uh, Tony Dorsett, and we just call him Tony D. When I say we, just (laughs) fans. Uh, Not me and my family when we went over to his house or anything like that. But anyway, all right, folks. That wraps up another week. God bless you. Uh, May God bless you and keep you until then. Keep coming back. It works if you work it. I'll probably be back next week. We always take this one week at a time. Be well.